Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stan Sklaroff, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today for the annual uh, Gittner Family Lecture. It's the capstone of our alumni weekend activities, so it's wonderful to see so many people here in the audience and joining us via live stream. For those of us who are here in person, uh, when you have questions to ask during the Q&A, we ask that you please come forward to the microphones so that the people who are watching via live stream can hear your questions also. For those of you who are joining us on live stream, unfortunately you won't be able to ask questions during the lecture, but I believe you could reach out via email to, to this, this afternoon's speaker. Uh, so yesterday we celebrated the inauguration of Boston University's new president, Dr. Melissa Gilliam, an award-winning interdisciplinary researcher in medicine, public health, and the humanities, is, who is committed to the arts and sciences. Before medical school, Dr. Gilliam received a master's degree in philosophy and politics from the University of Oxford. Today, we hear from someone in that field, the field of political science. Professor Elizabeth F. Cohen, the Maxwell Professor of United States Citizenship in the Department of Political Science and a political theorist who studies citizenship, immigration, and value of time in politics. Today's lecture explores immigration through a look at our nation's history. This is a particularly timely topic given the upcoming national election in November with immigration policy always a topic of debate between the presidential candidates. Before I introduce our, monitor, our moderator, I want to thank Jerry Gittner and his family for making this event possible. The annual Gittner Family Lecture was established to highlight research that addresses topics of major importance for the broad interest and benefit of the BU community. We're very fortunate to have alumni like Jerry, who can support and facilitate the opportunities for us to gather and engage as a community on critical topics like today's. A dedicated alumnus, Jerry Gittner graduated with a BA in history and was elected to Phi Alpha Theta, the National His History Honor Society. He is a trustee emeritus of Boston University and a member emeritus of the Dean's Advisory Board for the College of Arts and Sciences, and he is a current member of the Dean's Advisory Board for the Par Pardee School of Global Studies. Jerry is currently a chairman of Global Aero Hol Holdings Limited. He has occupied high-level positions in major airlines, most notably Transworld Airlines, also known as TWA, Pan American World Airways, and People Express Airlines. He has also served as the chairman and director of several aviation-related and non-aviation-related companies. Jerry is best known for his time as the CEO of TWA, in which time he increased the fleet numbers, renewed the fleet, improved the company's debt structure, won two J.D. Power Associate Awards, and ultimately facilitated the 2001 sale of the company to American Airlines. A few years ago, when one of our interns inter interviewed Jerry as part of our preparations for our 150th anniversary as a college, he responded, coming to, my degree from a coming to my career from a degree in history, rather than business or engineering, I had a very different perspective. Fine arts, music, language, languages, I was analytical. I knew how to think and how to ask the right questions. One of my mantras is, it's not the answer, it's the question that is critical. In the College of Arts and Sciences, we learned how to ask the right questions. In the spirit of asking the right questions, I'm going to introduce our moderator and let her get the discussion started. Nasli Kibria is a professor of sociology and interim chair of the sociology department. Nasli's research and teaching focus on areas of immigration, race, family, and childhood with a focus on South Asia and the Asian American experience. Her current projects include research on the experiences of economic decline in families on the negotiation of adult sibling relationships across divisions of social class, immigration, and citizenship. 
I'll now hand it over to Professor Kibria to let her introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Professor Elizabeth Cohen is the Maxwell Professor of United States Citizenship in the Department of Political Science here at Boston University. Professor Cohen received her undergraduate degree from Swarthmore College and her PhD in Political Science from Yale University. Professor Cohen was the associate editor of the flagship journal, The American Journal of Political Science, from 2019 to 2023. She has been a visiting scholar at Princeton, the Princeton University Center for Human Values, also at the Russell Sage Foundation, and the Wagner School of Public Service at NYU. Citizenship its meaning, significance, and consequences for democratic societies and the lives of people are the issues that Professor Cohen has been writing, speaking, and teaching about over the course of her career. She is the author of four books and numerous scholarly articles, as well as op-eds and commentaries in such media outlets as the Washington Post and the Atlantic. Her most recent book is titled Illegal, how America's Lawless Immigration Regime Threatens Us All. She has written about the political value of time in an award-winning book, and she introduces us to the concept of semi-citizenship, a term she coins to describe those who hold some but not all elements of full citizenship. Um, as as uh, Dean Slaroff mentioned, as we know, um, immigration, including a moral panic over immigration, uh, is a central issue, uh, maybe the issue in U.S. politics today as we head into the presidential election. So I'm looking forward to hearing Professor Cohen speak about this. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much, Stan and Nosley. And I want to thank all of you um, who decided that they wanted to be inside talking about immigration on a beautiful September day. Uh, I also want to say a few other words of thanks before turning to our topic at hand. Um, I want to thank the Gitner family for endowing this lecture and for all of their generosity. I think this might be the 10th anniversary. I could be wrong. I haven't been here that long, but I think this might be the 10th anniversary of the lecture, and I just think that's a really wonderful accomplishment. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I was thinking about this event uh, as I was preparing, and I just found that I was very moved by the kinds of generosity that the Gittner family, but a lot of alums, um, have, have shown toward our institution. And I think it's worth saying that these days, if you work in higher education, you are routinely confronted with public portrayals of what you do and what you value that are just unrecognizable. So we're accused of indoctrinating young minds on one day, and the next day we are begging our students to just read the syllabus. And it is no exaggeration to say that there is a war on education being waged in this country, and losing that war would spell disaster for our society. So the visible signs of your support being here, but you know, modest or grand visible signs, remind us that we are in this together and that you have our backs and we have your backs and none of us wanna live in a country without an educated, informed, and curious citizenry. So your solidarity means more than I can express. I also wanna thank everybody um, who's in attendance, but particularly I see some of my students um, and of course all of you alums were students at one point and I just wanted to say that um, I only moved to Boston a year ago, and before that time, I'd spent maybe a total of 10 days in Boston in my entire life. And to say that it was tough moving from dear friends and a life that was running pretty smoothly would be an understatement. I would not recommend just picking up and leaving in the middle of your life without a really good game plan, which I did not have. Um, and without fail, the thing I knew is that I would feel happy and at home for the hours of the week that I spent in the classroom with Boston University students. 
So there were brave souls that are in this room who signed up for a class that didn't even have a description in the catalog, let alone hub credits, but they were inquisitive and open-minded and hardworking and intellectually engaged and unbelievably kind. And it is just a joy to teach and be taught by such stellar students. Whether you're an alum or you're currently enrolled, I just want you to know that you also have been the best part of your professor's week. And I know that I speak for many on the faculty when I say that we respect and admire you and your well-being matters a lot to us. Last word of thanks is for the Dean's Office <laughs> for entrusting me with this role today. Um, I was invited to give this lecture in the spring and I accepted immediately, but we emailed back and forth about the topic for a while. And I had initially suggested that it should be something non-controversial, for example, the writing that I do and the right to control one's own time. It's relatable and it offends nobody who wouldn't want a little more control over their time. And I just kept getting these emails back that were super nice uh, from the dean's office, never nixing the idea of me talking about you know, control over our time, but just encouragingly telling me how much they were looking forward to my talk on immigration. <laughs> I need to say that Based on my experiences and in my mind, the idea of having anyone get up in front of alumni during alumni weekend to talk about immigration in September of the year 2024 is the functional equivalent of asking your drunk uncle to give the blessing at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> you do not know what is going to happen, but the probability of a brawl breaking out is very, very high. <laughs> but the emails were so nice that I felt like I couldn't say no. So we're going to talk about immigration. And I'm going to begin our discussion by reciting the Boston University Land Acknowledgement. I know normally land acknowledgements precede talks, but the content of Boston University's land acknowledgement sets the stage for our discussion better than anything I could compose on my own. So here it is. We acknowledge that the territory on which Boston University stands is that of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. Our auditorium and BU's campus are places to honor and respect the history and continued efforts of the native and indigenous community leaders which make up Eastern Massachusetts and the surrounding region. This statement is one small step in acknowledging the history that brought us to reside on the land and help us seek understanding of our place within that history. Ownership of land is itself a colonial concept. Many tribes had seasonal relationships with the land we currently inhabit. Pay attention to that. Today, Boston is still home to indigenous peoples, including the Mashpee Wampanoag and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead. This is a good place for us to start because it reminds us that European Americans and indigenous Americans have a very long and vexed history on both continents of the Americas. And it also underscores the idea of seasonal relationships with land, capturing a fact of human existence that is often ignored. Mobility is the norm. Stasis, particularly the kind imposed by lines on a map, is not the norm. Land moves, water moves, and people move. And this has always been true, and it always will be true. For decades, Gallup has polled Americans to gather opinion data about immigrants in the United States and immigration. And for decades, Americans' responses to the most generic versions of the questions have been largely positive. We have had positive opinions of immigration and immigrants, and the data was very stable. If you drill down, you can also find negative reactions. By the 1990s and the aughts, these negative reactions often adverted to the convenient framing, lawful immigration is desirable, but unlawful immigration is a problem in need of a solution. And interestingly, this was true even at points when there were more immigrants leaving the United States than entering, notably Mexican immigrants, which um, I think that point uh, plateaued immigration from Mexico uh, approximately in 2007. And in fact, that's right around when the United States starts spending dramatically more money on enforcement, um, right as in-migration switched to out-migration. In 2024, even people who are supportive of immigration will often express anxieties about the border, about security, and support for strengthening border enforcement. This is the 2024 version of I support legal immigrants, but illegal immigration is one of the most serious problems this country faces. I'm gonna come back to this position, which I suspect is represented in this room um, later on. 
It's still not the norm. What I hear more of and what I want to emphasize is curated by the media and may not represent how Americans think or feel, but what we hear more of is some of the most extreme xenophobia and hate that many of us have heard in our lifetimes. There's a way in which I think most of us have actually been put in the same boat. And in that boat, we are all riding out the maelstrom of what social scientists describe as a moral panic. And I think it's really appropriate that we have a sociologist, at least one, in the room, because this is a term that sociology, not political science, gave us. <clears throat> the United States is in the midst of a moral panic in response to the arrival of asylum seekers at its southern border. It is not the first moral panic this country has experienced, nor is it even the first moral panic about immigration that we've endured, but it is a powerful one, and it shows no signs of abating. At present, we are spending tens of billions of dollars to blanket swaths of our territory and area that extends beyond our borders with military-grade weapons and very sophisticated surveillance techno technology. These choices belie ongoing concerns about individual privacy and security, fiscal responsibility, and many other things we say we care about and I believe we do care about. At every turn, you will find that somebody is profiting handsomely from amplifying both fear and rage. U.S. Customs and Border Protection is the agency responsible for policing the border and everything that comes within a 100-mile distance of that border. So we're, in, we're, in, we're at the border now for their purposes. Their budget for 2024 is approximately $20 billion. That budget has quadrupled since 2003. For perspective, in that time, the average price of a gallon of milk has not even doubled. If you go back 10 more years to 1993, the budget for Border Patrol, as it was then called, was only $362 million, and that's million with an M, not even half a billion. Uh, immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, is the agency responsible for policing immigration on the interior of the United States. We're also in their jurisdiction. Uh, they received approximately $9 billion in 2024. So we have spent over $400 billion since 2003 on immigration policing. I think that's actually a conservative estimate. During that time, for every dollar spent on the immigration court system, where immigrants hope to plead their case and wait a very long time to plead their cases, we spend $24 on ICE and Border Patrol. So it's a 1 to 24 ratio. In 2021 alone, we spent $1.375 billion for just 55 miles of fencing along the Rio Grande. For reference, the southern border is about 2,000 miles long. And a good deal of this money that we're spending ends up in private hands. I'm not going to pause here to call out the private companies that spend billions lobbying us to pay them to imprison, to transport, and to surveil immigrants. But I will say that they are also surveilling and sometimes imprisoning US citizens as well. I'm not going to talk that much about that today, but it's something I've written about extensively. Enforcement is pitched as the means to protect citizens from the threat of outsiders, or at least some citizens and some outsiders. It is difficult to make the case about protection. Customs and Border Protection is the largest uh, federal law enforcement agency, or uh, it's larger than the FBI, the DEA, and all the other federal law enforcement agencies. Um, Customs and Border Protection agents are also five times more likely than any other law enforcement agents to actually be arrested for breaking the law themselves. And their agents have been caught torturing people, illegally collaborating with armed citizen militias who believe themselves to be the border police, uh, lying about their actions to internal investigations and ignoring court orders. So it was a Customs and Border Protection agent who's shot over the border, killing a young person on Mexican soil, which did not make us popular with the rest of the world. Yet they have been able to obtain more military-grade weapons with each passing year. And they are the agents that the Department of Homeland Security increasingly sends to interfere with protests that we would consider on the interior of the country and dealing only with issues going on in the interior of the country. For example, the protests following the police killing of George Floyd. In selecting moral panic as the orienting theme for this lecture, I wanted to introduce a concept that I thought would tie the past to the present and also at least start a conversation about where we go from here. 
So let me introduce this concept. I imagine most of you have heard the phrase moral panic, um, but it has a very precise meaning for social scientists. And if I get any of it wrong, we have a professional sociologist to correct me. Um, but the concept of moral panic was introduced in 1972 by a sociologist named Stan Cohen, who is not a relative of mine. Um, and he was really interested in the idea of deviance. So his attention was drawn to this massive overreaction to relatively tame fights that were breaking out in the early 1960s between members of two British, British youth subcultures, the mods and the rockers. I just find it, it sounds so quaint to me now. Um, but Cohen described moral panic with six features. This will just be slightly academic sounding and then I'll get back to um, out of that, that mode. But it's a condition, episode, person, or a group of persons um, that emerged to become defined as the threat to societal values and interests the nature of this threat is presented in a very stylized and stereotypical fashion or stereotyped fashion by the mass media. All the relevant moral boundaries are manned by the media, by religious figures, by politicians, and other right-thinking people. And socially accredited experts then pronounce their diagnoses and offer solutions. We, as kind of um, people taken up by the moral panic, uh, uh, evolve ways of coping. Um, sometimes we resort to them, we don't really evolve them. And then the condition either disappears or it submerges or it deteriorates and becomes more visible. Sometimes the object of the moral panic is novel and at other times it's something that's been in existence for a very long time. Sometimes the panic passes, it's forgotten. Maybe we remember it in folklore or some kind of um, memory. But at other times it has more serious and long lasting repercussions and it can produce changes that um, show up in our legal and social policy or even in the way we think of ourselves. There are four groups of people that play the most important role in triggering moral panic. Um, mass media, and I think mass media is the most important. There are moral entrepreneurs, um, sometimes control, uh, culture control figures, and the public. But really, I think our focus should be on the media here. They operate through exaggeration and distortion predicting dire uh, consequences of failure to act, and the creation of symbols that project ominous threats. And I think probably you can stop and think about the fact that you have observed this happening. With and sometimes through mass media enter the moral entrepreneurs, and those are individuals and groups who kind of campaign to eradicate immoral or threatening behavior. Certain points, people and agencies with institutional power enter the picture, the police, the courts, local and national politicians, and um, they become highly sensitized to deviations from what is considered normal. We get draconian, sometimes novel control measures and um, actors who will carry out such recommendations in our name as members of the general public who are receiving all of these cues to panic. Panics happen in part because they fulfill a function of reaffirming society's moral values. They just don't always do so in very positive ways. I wanna now just connect each element of moral panic to immigration policies in the United States so we can make a very clear connection between this concept uh, and what's happening. And then I'm gonna go through and kind of justify why I think this is a moral panic and not actually something to be panicked uh, about. So I said moral panic begins when a condition, episode, person, or a group emerges to become defined as a threat. And I would challenge anyone who has listened to the Springfield rhetoric we've been hearing over like, I think it's now over two weeks. Um, I don't really wanna repeat it, but I think you know what I mean. Contradict the idea that immigrants have been defined as a threat. <laughs> um, the Springfield attack on Haitian immigrants is just an escalation of a phenomenon we've witnessed for many years. And just by way of reminder, since we do have some alums in the room who will remember this, it was 1981, it was a year after the Marielle boat crisis, like when Castro was accused of emptying out Cuban prisons and psychiatric institutions and sending those people uh, to the United States. It was a year after that when undocumented immigration really became anything on the radar of the American public. Um, and there had been a very large number of immigrants coming into the country in the decades prior, pretty much since 1965, 
Um, many Asian refugees, many um, immigrants from Asia, and a steady stream of people coming from Mexico, among other places. But it was a boat carrying 33 Haitian people that overturned within a mile of the Florida coast that really triggered public concern. And to be clear, every single person on that boat, those 33 people, they drowned, they died before they got to the United States. But it was, it was that that triggered um, the public concern. We were not yet, I think, in a moral panic. I know this because in 1986, under Republican leadership and during Reagan's second term, the US Congress authorized the only amnesty for undocumented immigrants this country has ever offered. It's impossible for me to imagine that happening now. But it did happen in 1986. <clears throat> so what I said is that moral panic is triggered when a threat is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. And I think the origins of the process through which this happened lie in the 1990s. So in 1988, Rush Limbaugh, maybe some of you will remember Rush Limbaugh, um, he was a radio broadcaster and he got his nationally syndicated radio broadcast in 1998. And by the 1990s, the early 90s, there was an industry of far right wing, paleo conservative, they called themselves talk radio. And it was really an extraordinary new thing. And Limbaugh and his peers would broadcast very direct messages about the threats of immigration. They were often stereotyping immigrants. And there were changes to the broadcast laws at that time that affected, that greatly increased their audience. So they had way more people listening to them. And I'll just stop to say, I was like, I was a kid with insomnia back then, and I would listen to the radio at night when I could not sleep, and I remember this happening and thinking like, this is something really strange and kind of transfixing, like it, it absorbed you. By the 1992 presidential election, Limbaugh was actually quite powerful, and he endorsed a third party candidate named Patrick Buchanan. Uh, Buchanan was a former journalist who some of you may recall is the only presidential candidate in our lifetime before Donald Trump to have headed up a party centered on opposition to immigration. Parties opposed to immigration are very common in Europe, but they were not common in the United States. They're still not common in the United States. Um, but just look at what we have here. We have two uh, powerful media figures who rise to prominence by framing immigration as a threat to societal values and interests. This was what got them where they were. Next, you enter the experts. And the expert I want to name um, is a man named John Tanton. And he was um, active in anti-immigration politics until his death in 2019. This was somebody, he was an ophthalmologist. He had a medical degree. He was a successful professional. And he was also just absolutely obsessed with immigration politics. Um, starts like in the 1960s, he was like interested in eugenics and forced sterilization. And he was writing and he made really clear that although he was talking about the population, he was really just worried that whites were becoming a minority who would no, not, no longer be able to control the US government. But he, he talked about population growth because he knew it would be a way to sway um, or organizations, particularly the Sierra Club, who supported him. He got backing from um, an heiress to the Mellon fortune. A ton of money the Mellons put into um, building Tanton's movement to build an empire of anti-immigration organizations. And they've had an outsized influence in shaping public policy and public opinion. Um, you have heard in mainstream media uh, citations to the information, the data produced by these organizations. You probably didn't clock it. It may not ever even have been mentioned, but you have heard their material. Um, there are three in particular. One is called FAIR, Federation for American Immigration Reform. It remains the most powerful anti-immigration or one of the most powerful anti-immigration groups in the US. They push for legislative change. They work in tandem with a second organization called CIS, Center for Immigration Studies. They gather data, I'm gonna use that word lightly or loosely, that um, casts immigration in a negative light and then kind of sends it over to Congress. And then there's a third organization called Numbers USA that kind of um, stokes people's nativism. 
These are organizations categorized as hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center, but they're very normalized. Like I said, you will have seen them cited um, in mainstream news venues. And they each use very sophisticated seeming techniques to cloak what is largely junk science um, in the language of legitimate appearing policy research. <clears throat> um, Sierra Club and Tanton uh, team up to publish this book, right? Remember I said academic experts, legitimacy, and it was really just an argument for mass deportation and kind of speeding along the removal of people not born in the United States. It also suggested we should outlaw all new immigration, or almost all. And Tanton was very clear about um, the fact that he needed this kind of legitimacy. Uh, I'm just going to like um, draw something out. And this language is not mine. It's theirs. But uh, they said, we, we have to have these academics on our side because you can't show the public the rednecks. You have to show them the scientists. Again, not my language. Um, OK, I would argue that it took a really long time for Limbaugh and Tanton and many others, including um, Harvard's own Samuel Huntington, who I uh, debated about immigration in 2004, to succeed. Right? We're talking about the 90s. I think most of the people in this room cannot remember the 90s because they were not there. Um, but I was. I think the process advanced after September 11th. I think you can see the public nudged along further by the Tea Party in 2009. That's a movement Trump copies in his 2016 campaign. If you recall, and now most of you probably can remember this, um, Trump actually tried a lot of tactics before he settled on, uh, he realized like he kind of hit it out of the park with immigration. He knew from the reaction he got when he came down that escalator and talked about Mexican immigrants associating them with crime and many other scourges that he had found a weak spot he could exploit. But it didn't start out that way. Um, but the Tea Party had really prepared the ground for him, and before that, some of the figures I'm talking about. From 2016 to 2020, the moral panic that had taken hold of the Republican Party was very polarizing. So again, you may remember there was this outpouring of activism on the part of Democrats and people on the left in response. I mean, you know, when the first Muslim ban came down, there were people at the airports. We're in a very different place today, though. And if you listen to uh, Harris's Arizona speech last night, which in many ways I think was very successful, you heard her walk a fine, fine line. So she talked about dreamers, and she talked about longtime undocumented workers who can't get citizenship. But she's touting the border bill that Trump tanked, but many congressional Democrats and the, some of the furthest right congressional Republicans supported. And that bill, if you took it back to the 1990s and showed it to Pat Buchanan or Rush Limbaugh or John Tanton, they would have been thrilled. I, think, I don't even think they would have imagined they could succeed that thoroughly. So this is where we are today. And today, when I talk to people who are staunchly opposed to almost everything that the far right paleo conservative movement stands for, they will still often express a little anxiety about immigration, which they might couch in terms of talking about the border. I do not blame anyone who is constantly subjected to these images and these messages for firmly believing that any panic we are experiencing is not moral panic, but panic over an actual real threat. And so I want to say a few things about this as well. And I want to talk about the components of what someone who sees threat right now uh, in, the, in the form of immigration or the border might refer to. So I want to talk a little bit about crime. Widely studied topic is immigrant criminality. This is the kind of thing that FAIR puts together data about. And I can confidently say that if your main concern is crime in the United States, the best possible thing we can do is raise the proportion of the population that's foreign born and deport those of us who were born here. Foreign born people commit crimes at lower rates <laughs> than do US born people. And this has been studied over and over again. And I know the people who did the studies, they're very qualified. Furthermore, the kinds of crime that many asylum seekers flee, uh, Central American countries, uh, to escape. I know we are not just getting people from Central American com uh, countries coming to the border, but those in particular. That's our crime, by which I mean that um, in the 1980s and 1990s, we incarcerated in Los Angeles a group of Central American immigrants who we later deported. While they were in US prisons, they were inducted into US 
gangs started in the United States and are run by Americans like MS-13. And when we deported those people we had incarcerated, they brought our gangs back to Central America, which then took root and have resulted in mass flight from gang violence. In addition, traffickers who are parts of very large organized crime rings also exist largely because of US practices. Starting in the early 1990s at the request of Democrat President Clinton, the United States began an enforcement practice known as deterrence by attrition. Border police were directed away from legal ports of entry and to places where immigrants were known to cross the border without inspection, but in relatively safe ways. Once we directed agents there, it forced people who were trying to cross the border uh, to, into using more and more dangerous routes to cross the desert where they were more likely to die. This is not like um, an unintended consequence. I will speak about some of those, but this was the intended consequence of that policy, and we have very clear evidence of this. The unintended consequence, and there always is an unintended consequence, I'm sure this one's obvious to everyone in the room, it was the growth of the trafficking industry. Because once people have to go through dangerous territory, they need help. And organized crime is always happy to step into just such an opportunity. They'll always fill that gap. So those are some things I think we should think about when we're hearing things about criminality. I want to now talk a little bit about resource burden. So lots of people who are concerned about the border are actually concerned about the resources that might be um, consumed if we uh, persist in letting immigrants into the country. Um, I take on a very concrete issue that people seem concerned about, and that's like policy and social benefits. So you'll hear lots of things you probably have about all the social benefits that immigrants soak up. Um, in fact, in, ter in terms of federal law, immigrants qualify for almost no, none of these um, programs. What they are required to do is pay their taxes. And it's long and boring, but I can talk to you about how immigrants pay uh, income taxes. I'll just say that a lot of immigrants pay income taxes even when they are unlawfully present. Um, it, it would be a great concern of theirs to not pay their taxes because that increases the chances that they have broken more than one law. They also pay property taxes and sales taxes. It amounts to about $100 billion um, a year. Generally, the money that they pay into Social Security and Medicare taxes um, when they're paying their income taxes does not accrue to them. And I think the technical term for this is a racket. We are running a racket because we are extracting taxes from people who will not benefit from the programs those taxes support. The one exception I'll say to the resource rule has to do with immigrant children who are in public schools. Citizens for a brief period of time do pay the lion's share of that cost, though any immigrant who owns a home is paying property taxes, which as you know is how we fund our public schools. We do give a little bit of aid to refugees, modest aid to asylum seekers, very, very little, and virtually none while people are applying for asylum. That wait lasts a very long time because remember, we spend $1 on immigration courts to adjudicate these cases for every 24 we spend on enforcement. We do, however, stand to lose a lot by sealing the border. I think when people talk about the kind of expense here that immigrants, um, uh, co the costs of immigrants entering the country, they're kind of imagining a world in which there are no resources expended on preventing immigrants from entering the United States and we don't lose the largely invisible resources that we are drawing from immigrants. That's a fantasy brought to you by moral panic, which is really the worst enemy of rational thought. Deportation is actually quite expensive. Um, I talked a little bit about the, the amount of money spent on immigration enforcement. Let me just isolate for you the costs of deportation. So you may kind of think, oh, we have to bring people outside of the border. It costs just $3,000 to transport each person from the country. That's not that much money, although it does add up if you want a Trump style, I think 20 million is the highest figure he's floated. Um, but the actual cost of a deportation extends to custody and to surveillance. So ICE currently has about 40,000 beds in detention centers, each of which costs $57,000 a year to maintain. Our best estimate is that it costs around 13000 per person to engage in a single deportation. 
In 2015, when Trump proposed his first mass deportation, it was estimated that it would cost half a trillion dollars. He's upped the number of people that he wants to deport by a lot, and he wants to involve local law enforcement, so the price tag has gone up. This month, actually just a few days ago, the Peterson Institute, it's a nonpartisan uh, institute, uh, released a study about what we lose when we deport people beyond the costs of the deportation and the investment in preventing those people who are deported from returning. So they modeled a bunch of different deportation scenarios. You know, we don't really know what, um, if Trump were elected, what he wants, but we do know that there are plenty of people, um, plenty of Democrats who are also advocating for some amount of deportation. There's a modest scenario, so there's really extreme scenarios, but Peterson took the modest scenario, well, they took all of them, but I'm taking the, the modest scenario, which is just 1.3 million people deported from the United States. This is the low scenario, even though many congressional Democrats probably actually advocate for more. The Peterson model shows that the US real GDP declines from baseline um, by about between 1.2 or 7.4 percent by 2028 if we do this. Employment in the United States also falls, so um, by 2028, even in the low scenario, employment is 1.1 to 6.7 percent below baseline. If you're wondering like how employment falls when people who are taking jobs supposedly are deported, it might be helpful to know that this is often what happens during periods of low migration or deportation um, because businesses that depend on immigrant labor tend to either close because they can't afford to stay in business anymore, um, or they automate to offset the expenses of losing immigrant labor. So an overall hit to economic growth is also, is also um, bound to hit employment. I can't emphasize enough how devastating a hit this would be to the country um, if we take this approach to immigration and how much worse it would get if we kind of fully accede to the moral panic policies. One last note on the question of resources uh, and immigration, and that has to do with the aging population in, in uh, Europe, the United States, and most industrialized economies. We're really fortunate in the United States. We're kind of insulated from something the rest of the world, um, or rest of peer nations in the world has been dealing with. Our population, like their populations, does not, there are not enough children being born to meet replacement level. It's been, this has been a problem for a while. A replacement level is 2.1 children per woman. Um, the reason we've been insulated is that we have been um, fortunate enough to be a place where immigrants still want to come. Immigrants are disproportionately young and in their prime working years, and that is how we are sustaining ourselves. In other countries with low birth rates, the consequences have been devastating. It's terrible for an economy to balance an aging, non-working population with high needs on the back of shrinking worker pool. But I think about this all the time when I'm thinking about what it's gonna be like to be old in the United States. If you look at Japan, Italy, Scandinavian countries, and other places where this has happened, it's done great damage to their economies. And each of these countries has had to invest a great deal of resources to try and counteract these effects. Some of these measures have worked, many have not. But we haven't had to do this because we have not yet persuaded people born in other countries to stop trying to come here. We make it very difficult, but we haven't persuaded them yet. I promise you, if we persist, there will come a time when people will yearn to live in a country that attracts young, working, and parenting age people. So your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will wonder what we were thinking in 2024 when we looked at images of people trying to come to the United States to work and raise families and just shut the door on them. We might already um, be there in some ways. I don't, I'm just gonna mention that um, DHS Secretary Mayorkas said recently, we should take a look at economic prosperity. There's bipartisan agreement that our economy benefits from migrant labor, He's looked, said, take a look at the non-agricultural, unskilled H-2B visa. Um, Republicans and Democratic governors, senators, House members, they all are upset about the cap, the, that the maximum number is so low and really has not increased very much since the 1990s. Um, and really, the numeric limits were set in 1996, so it's 2024, you can do that math. By the way, i just like to say that was a quote I personally don't think there is such a thing as unskilled work. There is only poorly paid work. And if you do not believe me, try farming for a week. Get back to me. 
Um, the United States has always selected agricultural workers to bring into the country based on very specific needs, the types of crops we cultivate, and the places where people really know how to cultivate those crops well. Okay, so that's just a little economic picture if you're thinking there's an economic crisis associated with immigration. Um, I would say, again, the balance still falls to moral panic. I wanna third talk about um, an existential crisis. So I wanna speak to people who think that we are not in a moral panic, but actually see an existential crisis because immigration brings change and in particular, it brings demographic change, and that will mean that the country does not look or sound the way they want it to look or sound. So xenophobia is, it's a scourge, obviously. I think many of us agree with this, but let me return to Sam Huntington's telling. Um, he identified and analyzed this purported crisis of national identity brought on by threats to what he called the creed and the culture. Um, and if you, didn't read Sam Huntington at any point. I think just good to know that he was one of the most influential political scientists of the 20th and early 21st century, and he um, taught at the university across the river. Um, and he 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 kind of said our our American identity is being superseded by these inchoate doctrines, emphasize many things that really don't have anything to do with our origins. Our creed, he said emphasizes liberty, equality, and the sacred rights of the individual. And from this, we have extrapolated the political values of work, representative government, and private property. So like, this is who we are as Americans. And the book was um, actually entitled, Who Are We? And so he was seeming, seeming to be saying, well, we've lost our ability to convert people, this kind of evangelical Americanism. We don't convert new people. They don't seem to be like us. Um, and then we have gone on to lose our practical power of, um, of moral suasion. And it's a very genteel narrative, the way Huntington tells it in this book. Like, it's a long book, and it's full of flowery language. Um, I don't personally see much space, though, between Huntington and Trump. And I will just point out that outside of the context of the book, in the article version of the book, he expressed fear of what he called the browning of America. When I addressed Huntington 20 years ago, I asked him to show me an argument that we have obligations to remain true to our past self. But to you, I want to make a different point. And it starts with something familiar, and that is that at no point in US history have we considered most of the immigrants who were coming into the United States white. So we have not regarded um, immigrants as white. We have not regarded them as morally desirable, we have regarded them as criminal, as poorly educated, as unable or unwilling to behave in the ways that we want them to. So in the 18th and 19th centuries, whiteness excluded Catholic people. In the 19th and 20th centuries, whiteness excluded Irish people. Now it does not. In 1924, whiteness excluded Southern and Eastern Europeans, ethnically Irish, Italian, Hungarian, Russian, Jewish, and many other immigrants were not white. Now they are. In the 1920s and 30s, Madison Grant railed against Swedish immigrants for not being white. Swedish immigrants. And my point is not that xenophobia is a terrible thing, although I think it is. And it's not just that some parts of whiteness change while others endure. My point is just a practical one, and that is we are actually really, really bad at achieving the goals of xenophobia. So the goals of xenophobia are to engineer the population to look a certain way, whatever way the xenophobes want, and at no point in US history have we been able to effectively engineer our population through changes to immigration law. So if I were to take you through a close history of the major pushes the United States government has made to engage in mass deportation and border closure, what you would see is that each attempt accomplishes the precise opposite that the people pushing for it want to accomplish. Um, for example, 1924, we had a massive set of quotas passed to uh, limit immigration from almost all countries where people were actually coming. Um, 10 years later, if you look at the statistics, it looks like it was a success, but actually we were just turning to new sources of immigrant labor within the Americas and eventually the development of temporary labor programs that brought people to the United States who turned out not to be temporary residents. There was 
mass brutality at this time, but there was also just a new stream of immigrants coming into the country. If what we wanted was a whiter America, that law did not achieve it. It actually simply uh, reoriented where non-white immigrants were coming into the United States. We overrode this law in 1965. This is considered like the opening of the US border. I, the authors of that bill were not actually very excited about demographic change either. They thought they were being super clever. So in this law, you get family reunification, which is something you've heard of. You may have heard it called chain migration, but we get family reunification. And let me just say that the idea of family reunification was that we could, without saying we were gonna have European sponsor, sponsor European people to come here. That was what they wanted. They were like, oh, well, the Germans and the Italians are white now. Let's get German and Italian people to sponsor more German and Italian people to come here. And we can do it with a wink and without like saying we're racist. Um, you may have noticed that's not what happened. Okay, in 1990, Congress created the diversity lotter lottery, the diversity lottery to, I kid you not, create a pathway for the legal immigration of Irish citizens. And the guy who did this routinely harasses any of us who say this out loud um, because he wants to claim it's not true. But if you go online, you will see pictures of him in Ireland telling Irish people, I'm going to find, I'm going to succeed in this way for you to enter the United States legally. Um, 2016, it was the diversity lottery that Trump was talking about when he used the word that I will not repeat in this context to talk about people coming from undesirable countries. You may remember the word. Um, because the diversity lottery became one of the pathways for non-white majority countries uh, to send immigrants to the United States. Many of those are African nations like Nigeria. By the way, Nigerian immigrants are described by the US Department of State as the most educated and successful immigrant group entering the United States. 61.4% of Nigerian immigrants, uh, 25 or older, hold a bachelor's degree compared to around 29% um, of the US population. So we are not just bad at getting the work of xenophobia done. We're like the keystone cops of xenophobia. <laughs> and if Stephen Miller really wanted to do what he says he wants to do, he would just take a look at this history and then slowly back away <laughs> from making any legislation or trying to uh, propose legislation or enforcing uh, restrictive laws because they always achieve the opposite of what the people writing them want to achieve. All of this is just to say if no moral panic were unfolding, harsh uh, immigration enforcement still does not uh, close borders. It just reorients the inevitable process of human movement. Just keep in mind the land acknowledgement that I recited earlier, people move when they're left to their own devices. Very often that movement is circular, meaning that people go somewhere, they move on, they return and they repeat. In fact, we have data showing that if the US border were not so dangerous for people who don't have status to cross over, many, many people would come and go as they did before we had militarized the border. We just make it so difficult that they can't do this. If I haven't persuaded you that the immigration crisis is a moral panic and um, not a response to security, to economic or existential threats in the United States, I'll, I hope you'll just sit with some of the ideas that I've presented and consider them. But the talk included in its title, the phrase, where do we go from here? Um, I intended this to mean several things. I wanted to evoke the feeling that people have when they flee hostile homes and they wonder to themselves, where do we go from here? But I know probably to most of you, it triggered a hope that I could shed some light on what will or should happen going forward. I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> um, moral panics resolve in several ways. Uh, sometimes attention shifts, sometimes they get worse, sometimes we get persuaded out of our panic. We've been in the worsening phase for some time now. We're awash in images that reinforce what moral entrepreneur entrepreneurs worked to persuade us of for decades. So the language and the emotions of threat are everywhere we turn, and the legal change element of moral panic has been highly consequential. So if you are among the people here who objects to this condition, I think our work lies in transforming how we think and speak about borders and human movement. As I said earlier, moral panics happen in part because they fulfill a function of reaffirming society's moral values. They just don't do so in particularly positive ways. I think 
if you are in this group of people who wants to push back, it means pushing back against certain kinds of fundamental ideas that frame this entire discussion. So this is work we do on ourselves. I want to emphasize two kinds of work we can do on ourselves. First has to do with how we think about the idea of legality. So much of the success of the moral panic in persuading anybody about the Rush Limbaugh's of the world can be traced back to the wedge issue of legal versus illegal status. And you could hear this last night in Harris's rhetoric, but we have been hearing it from opinion polls for decades. And when it is invoked, it always relies on a grammar of choice. Immigrants who choose to come illegally or immigrants who cannot choose to come legally, so they come illegally. And I think when we talk about this, even that latter point, which I think is a fairly um, immigrant-friendly way of thinking about things, it still misrepresents who's doing the choosing. In fact, it's us. We in the United States choose who is legal and who is not legal. We are in complete control of whether anyone entering the United States does so illegally. We invented the concept of illegal immigration, and I mean this in a very specific way. In 1929, we have le legislation called the Registry Act, and in that, we create the concept of illegal immigration and create penalties. The concept didn't exist before that. So this is something we invented. It is in our hands. Immigrants don't decide to be illegal. We decide they are illegal. We choose who is legal and who is illegal. And at the very least, we need to acknowledge that we have the agency here, and we can choose, even if we in this room can't change any laws, we can choose to change how we think about this concept and that responsibility. The other frame I want to propose pushing back against is the idea of crisis. So we hear constantly of a crisis at the border, an immigration crisis. And at all times, these phrases are used to mean that the arrival of immigrants has created a crisis. In fact, just as the United States decides who's legal and who's illegal, we are also the agent of this crisis. So you're seeing images all the time, and it looks like a crisis. These are crisis images. And I think this is because we have invested in maintaining a crisis. Remember how much money we spend on enforcement. But at a more basic level, we're just choosing to spend far more money on policing than it would cost to actually accommodate people who are arriving here to work and to live. So the military-grade weapons, the ankle monitors, the detention facilities, the agents, the wall, we choose to spend that money when we could be spending it in other ways, spending a lot less of it in other ways. I don't hear many demands for this kind of rethinking. So when you see images of people in camps in Mexico or sleeping outside of bus stations, sleeping in Logan Airport, um, I think the first thing that should come to mind is not that, that they're um, in this scene that's, a, that's some kind of crisis. It's a display that's intentionally engineered to provoke a sense that immigrants are the crisis. The images could be replaced. We know exactly how long and how much it takes for refugees to become self-sufficient in the United States, and the answer is very little. It's a drop in the bucket of the money we actually spend. But we have actually instead been kind of sucked in to seeing that as a crisis. I don't think the process of reaffirming moral values that work against moral panic happens very quickly. I just think it is the best work that we can do on ourselves to ensure that we are not passively somehow affirming the presence of a panic. When I concluded my exchange with Samuel Huntington, I cited the title of his book on immigration, Who Are We? And I simply suggested to everyone present that we think about instead who we want to be. And as with any other aspiration, being who we want to be takes a lot of work, but it is work that we have done as a nation before. It's work we are all capable of doing, and it is work that will reward us in many, many ways. Thank you very much for your time. Professor Cohen for that very interesting and stimulating lecture. So uh, we fortunately have some time now for discussion. So uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, if you could please come to the, yes, come to the. 
Um, please introduce yourself briefly before you have your question. wasn't really part of your talk, but I just always have wanted to ask an expert about, is that um, so many of the Americans that are here that are established, that are making it, that make a reasonable salary, need to hire people to be their gardeners, their nannies. Um, we also need to do the construction work. We need people to work in fields, to do work, uh, I mean, cropping, I mean, picking vegetables, of course, is a job that is, is terribly onerous and difficult. And there's a need for these people, and so how how, how why is that why is that need not seen? So it's a, it's a really great question. I think we kind of um, saw the uh, to me the the hypocrisy was really uh, crystallized when we first saw Trump come on the scene with the anti-immigrant rhetoric, and so. Um, one of the biggest sectors for immigrant labor, but particularly short-term immigrant labor, which tends to be bringing in people who often will overstay visas and become undocumented, is um, construction and hospitality. And construction and hospitality, if Trump has succeeded at anything, and it's not clear that he has, is like where he has succeeded. So it means he has succeeded on the back of a lot of immigrant labor. And so the question of why this work is invisible or unvalued, I think you know, there are many, many um, subtle and not so subtle cues to not value that work. I cited one, which is we, in our, in, in our own language, um, refer to skilled and unskilled visas or skilled and unskilled work. Um, so I think already there's a sense just in the law that it's not particularly valuable that people, any, it, it's inter, like interchangeable pegs could be put in any of the holes in that labor market were the people doing that work to disappear. So I think there's some class bias there, but I also think, frankly, the, the biggest reason that we don't see this um, kind of a little bit of concern over what our lives and society would be like if there weren't people doing this work is because we've never experienced it. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I neither want to kind of reinforce the idea that we should um, have a, a status hierarchy or reinforce the existing status hier hierarchy of work, N but I, I also just really think that um, it, it's invisible work because of how, how we think about that and the fact that we have never, we've just never in our lifetimes gone through what, we, what happened to the country in 1924, which was a massive um, drop after the law that changed that what didn't allow European immigrants to come anymore. If we did, we'd, we'd learn a lesson. Hi, uh, my name is Randy Feldman. I'm a graduate of the law school here and have practiced immigration law in Massachusetts for the last 34 years. I want everybody in the room to know that by far, I think the hardest law specialty is immigration law. And when I write about immigration law, I, um, I, I hire an immigration lawyer essentially to check my work and I pay them out of my own pocket even though um, uh, there are Cokes, the Coke Foundation will give you so much money to do this work, <laughs> um, but bless you. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I wanna suggest that the issue really now, over the last three and a half years, is more about the rule of law than anything else. And, and, and it's the, that combined with the numbers that keep driving the point across. It used to be that when you'd come across the border illegally, you would then enter into a legal process <laughs> if you applied for political asylum. So I entering illegally was a civil violation. You sent to immigration court in a deportation proceeding, unless you did it numerous times and then it's a criminal event. Short of that, you then enter into a legal process where you apply for political asylum. Used to be that there was a credible fair standard where people would say, do you have a, a legitimate claim to political asylum? And the Biden administration, I'm a Democrat, a big fan, the Biden administration, felt so overwhelmed at the border that they stopped doing credible fear interviews at the border. 
And when they stopped doing that, it wasn't just Central American people fearing crime, fearing persecution, uh, fearing um, abject poverty, but people started to come from all over the world to apply for asylum at the border. Oftentimes, not the poor people or peasants, but middle class people from Asia, from the Middle East, from Africa, joined the Latin American people who were poor and flee poverty, crime, and sometimes persecution. The numbers of the people coming across the border and the spuriousness of the, the weakness of the asylum claims, if there was any claim at all that would fit into the matrix of what truly political asylum is, has created a problem that the rule of law is now really what's at issue. And for me, it's very hard because I spent my whole time saying the rule of law is violated all the time. Let me give you some examples. But it has now gotten so big, so numerous, that the rule of law is really what the issue is at this point. And what we do with that for people who want comprehensive immigration law, who want more immigration, and who spent a whole lifetime trying to defend more immigration, but now have to fight against a border that's so porous that so violates the rule of law is a very difficult challenge. Thank you. So there's um, some parts of that that are um, super in the weeds, and I don't want to like drill down too far. Uh, but I, I want to make one kind of general point, which is if you're worried about the rule of law, it, it may sometimes mean that the law was unsustainable. And there's a you know, for political theorists and people who write about immigration, there's a lot of um, kind of uh, pushback against the idea that there ever should have been a distinction between political asylum and um, what we call economic migration in the first place, right? So the rule of law imposes that distinction, but it, like many government boxes we have to check, <laughs> including the census, <laughs> we're kind of forced to put ourselves into boxes that don't necessarily reflect like how people experience um, migration or many other circumstances in life. I, I just don't think those were particularly useful categories and part of the reason there's been a, a breakdown is because they weren't that meaningful for the people who needed to use them. Now, the other part of what you're saying is just that there are a lot of people trying to come across the southern border. Um, and my view is that when there are large numbers of people trying to enter the country, it gen generally does not have that much to do with choices we've made inside the country. So you've placed a lot of weight on the credible fear interview um, process, which is meaningful. But if you take like a very broad view of when there have been large numbers of people coming into the United States and when those, no you know, the ebb and the flow, um, there's a lot of push factor involved that we just don't control. And sometimes the push factor is present and sometimes it's not. So nobody was really expecting the thing I mentioned in 2007, right, when we started to see more people leaving the United States to go back to Mexico than entering the United States. Uh, but in fact, there were circumstances that made it a desirable thing to do. We, but we didn't do that, that simply happened. So. My, my view is like, we can try to control some of this, but we just don't control most of the world. If but thank had, you for uh, the question. If we had a, a better humanitarian policy, then it would be legal. So, and these are humanitarian, they're mostly driven by poverty. It's mostly economic migration, fleeing very bad poverty and very bad cr criminal cases sometimes, uh, crime situations. Uh, but we don't have a, a full humanitarian panoply of choices, so people force themselves into the asylum system, but it, it's still not clear. Yeah. Just to add to that a little bit, that I think that, you know, those who argue for comprehensive immigration reform, which I think has almost gone out of fashion, but part of the reason that we have such a kind of, um, you know, over, overflow of, uh, you know, asylum cases and people at the border is that other immigration, you know, other sort of quotas and abil the ability of people to migrate, come to the U.S. to work um, is also so limited. So I think part of the issue is that other, you know, there, there are not enough, there are not enough other kinds of entry points, legal entry points. 
Um, and so I think uh, from, a, you know, from a very practical angle, I, I was actually gonna ask this, um, that you know, what would it take to uh, arrive at a more humane, um, you know, humane sort of system or situation? And I think to take what uh, the previous gentleman was, uh, his, his question, that there is a sense in which people think the system is broken, and I think that I agree with that, that there needs to be sort of policy change. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. Oh, I have many thoughts on yeah. this. <laughs> um, I mean, one thing, you know, that I was thinking about when I was writing this talk, and, you know, we think about it a lot when we're write, those of us who write about immigration. The last time we had um, real comprehensive immigration reform was uh, 1965. And um, so, again, for alums in the room, we made some serious changes in 1996 that really allowed the kind of heavy enforcement environment that we're in, particularly the, like the money we're spending. A lot of that stems back to, to 1996. And if you do the math, so that was um, when Clinton was president, the 1965 laws changed um, under LBJ. Uh, and if you do the math on that, we are like, if you were, as I was, just entering into adulthood, <laughs> um, starting off in the world in 1996, and you were thinking about what happened in 1965, we're that far now from what we did in 1996. So it's like, if you can imagine how far in the past you thought LBJ was when you were like in college in the 90s, something like that, that's how far we are from that. So we really um, have let this go for a very long time. And one of the things that's happened over that period of time is that there's been, there's no constituency with a lot of power actually pushing for that type of change. So, you know, I emphasize this all the time, but this is like, this is, I talked about Trump, but this is a nonpartisan or it's an all partisan <laughs> problem in the sense that like, if you look at what was going on during, you know, the three democratic presidencies in this century, um, or even, uh, sorry, stemming back into the 90s, in the last um, 25 or 30 years, what you've seen is actually more, um, more opposition to kind of opening immigration or relaxing some of the really restrictionist policies. The, the people who wanted harsh enforcement, who wanted to really close all those avenues for coming lawfully and unlawfully, um, their best allies have been Democrats. So there's just no balance there. Um, there's nobody with a lot of power really um, willing to take any risks, and it is a risk. And so every time you get a Democrat, that Democrats are kind of excited about, the one thing you'll hear them give on is immigration, and everybody then says, well, we gotta give on something, but it's always immigration. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Morgan Jenkins. Um, I don't know if this is like short-sighted because I haven't read any of Huntington's work, but I'm thinking about like, if historically like at the core of this country, the like grunt work or like unskilled work has been performed by non-American born, like non-white people, mm -hmm. Um, what about like having employing white people only in those like unskilled jobs feels like a return to core values for people like Huntington? That's uh, a, you know that's a great question. I can't necessarily speak for Huntington. Um, you know, I my guess is that Huntington would who was expressing extremely elitist views about immigration may have held some other elitist views and in fact thought that there's a population of US born people who were suited to work that he was clearly not ascribing much um, respect. So I, I, that's my guess about what Huntington would say to that. I, I, and it gives me joy to know that not every college student is reading Huntington at this point. <laughs> sparks some joy for me because there was a time when I could say like, oh, Huntington and everybody would, 
immediately say that they'd been assigned some Huntington. And leaving politics aside, um, like, yeah, I went through the citations in that book before I, I had that debate with him, and they just did not correspond to actual facts. So that, that I think Huntington would have um, relatively, like, hierarchical, like, elite-driven views about that. My name is Stacy Gilsheimer. I'm actually an economist um, here at BU, teaching in the econ department. But I have always been super curious as to whether there's any work done on the effects of exposure and wondering if maybe um, people who are more exposed to diversity and, and diverse populations are more likely to support them. And do we find that uh, people who are sort of in those rural areas where there is much less diversity. Do we know that that's a relationship? I've, I've always wondered, and um, I'm sorry if that's outside of your no, no, area. No, 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 it's I a great, also I'm now I'm like sweating because there's a law, an immigration lawyer and an economist <laughs> in the room, and what was I talking about? <laughs> immigration law and economics of immigration, and I'm a political theorist. You did um, a great job, by the <laughs> way. <Thank you. laughs> um, so, th so there is both research on actual circumstances of contact, and there's you know, a whole bunch now of kind of lab and survey experiment work being done on exposure. And um, you know, the results of that research s give us reasons to be optimistic. So often exposure does actually generate um, over time you know, more tolerant attitudes. Um, you know, we're not in that moment in the news anyway, so what we're seeing is Springfield. And you can see other instances of um, circumstances in which, like, you just very visible nativism. But again, like, that's moral panic. I want to point something out, which is you said, oh, we're in rural areas where there's not as much diversity. But in fact, in the United States, there's a lot of immigrant presence in rural areas. Um, and I don't just mean like, oh, immigrants have always been in rural areas because they're, those are people who may be um, more likely to do farm work. There have been relatively like mid to recent um, migrations to places where in the past there weren't immigrants living that we would consider rural, um, predominantly white, and um, inclined to pretty nativist views. But people are coexisting. so you get to the point when Trump was elected when you saw people saying like, oh, that, well that's actually like my town. I didn't mean my neighbor when I said I wanted, I was like imagining some, some other immigrants being deported, but not like my cousin who's married into the family or, you know. So, you know, those communities have been finding ways to overcome the day-to-day um, -day experience of moral panic in many cases, quite successfully. And I was living in one, so you know, I can tell you that until very recently, there was a lot of success. Hi, I'm Rachel Mead, uh, your colleague nice in political <laughs> science. Nice to see you. Um, <laughs> great talk. Um, so, I mean, this is this is a little bit, you know, based on our mutual interests in the field of political science. But um, I wish I could have seen this debate between you and Sam Huntington. Uh, I and didn't I'll just know say when I was, I was in getting into. Yeah, <laughs> when I was in grad school, we read part of um, various works by Huntington, and I remember the the journalistic version of the book yes. "Who Are We," which I thought was exceptionally racist. And I remember we didn't talk, we, t we talked about it in an academic way and, and it wasn't addressed that it, it seemed, I mean, he was, like you said, it, it, like really explicitly xenophobic. And I guess I'm wondering, w like, why do you think, or like, what, what enables academics who are putting forward ideas that are, um, in this case, like xenophobic, uh, and, and not that different from, from people that academics would sneer at, right? What allows them to be accepted as sort of a moral authority or, or separate from that? And I don't know, what can we do about this? <laughs> Is the situation improving? 
think the answer to the question is Harvard. Harvard allowed that. <laughs> um, uh, I, it's like a joke, but also I mean quite seriously that if you look at, and I've spent, I mean, I, <laughs> I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, and went to Yale. Like, I have spent a lot of time around elite institutions, and there's a very, um, not, not only, like, are these places where exactly what you hear from Huntington is a, a part of the, the ethos of a school in some, some senses, but there is also just very clear um, streams of money flowing in from particular people who are, want to advance that agenda. Um, so there are, I won't like name any names, but if you look at um, some of the primary sources of donations to uh, Princeton University, for example, you'll see a, a, like a, a natural law inflected, very far right um, bent that is not particularly interested in diversity in fact, is pretty threatened by diversity. So there's, there's a history and there's something very new, or, you know, relatively new happening both at the same time that um, pays for things to happen that give the institutional veneer of authority and respectability to, in the case of that particular data or, or presentation of data, w was not deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Nelson, uh, COM88, wonderful um, talk. Thank you very much. Um, two questions for you. One, going back to, I think, the original question around employment, one of the things I've been curious about over the last couple of years is how much of our labor shortage in um, hospitality and construction is actually a result of the, of the recent um, focus on immigration. Um, and then secondly, um, one of the things I thought you was really interesting about what you talked about at the beginning was the unintended and intended consequences. I'm curious what your perspective is on the bipartisan um, bill for immigration that uh, uh, Vice President Harris is um, willing to promote. What you see as some of the maybe intended or unintended consequences of that legislation? Okay, great set of questions. I can't produce like offhand data about kind of if we hadn't um, in various ways reduced immigration, legal pathways to immigration, what the, the job shortage situation would look like because it's a slight kind of counterfactual that's a little bit hard to, uh, I, I would be like a little dishonest if I was like, oh, this is what would have happened. Um, it is my intuition, however, that um, based on past experience, that if we weren't in a, the position now where almost all legal pathways to enter the United States are very, very constricted, um, you know, we probably would not be seeing uh, th that was those types of labor shortages. Um, so, yeah. Uh, as to the bill, th I think the bipartisan bill, um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not really a fan. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, you know, how long are we gonna spend more money every year on, in, on border enforcement? I mean, Harris has actually said, like, she's even interested in built wall building. And if there's one thing we know is not effective, it's trying to wall off the southern border. It's just, you know, people will just find different ways to enter the country, even if it means more trafficking or tunnels or, you know, the these water borders or the northern border, like there is just a drive for people to escape circumstances that are unlivable. And so I can't, again, predict specific unintended consequences of that, but I can show a pattern in the past that the unintended consequences of being extremely restrictionist are um, you know, more types of more dangerous um, voyages into the United States and definitely not an end to immigration coming into the United States. Just a, f just a follow up to that. Um, I guess my impression was that some of what that bill was trying to do was to provide more money um, to address some of the shortage of um, 
the ability to address um, the, the cases uh, of mm -hmm. people coming into the country. Yes. That seems like that makes sense, but um, what would be your recommendation on how to address some of those challenges? So yeah, it's true. There are more money for adjudication. The, the, sc the scale of starvation for adjudication is almost hard to convey. And the, you know, if, if we have an immigration lawyer in the room, maybe uh, he can verify that like, that it's so broken, right? Like it is trying to get these various agencies to even send you the right paperwork or, f you know, it is so broken. Um, so it's good that there be more money for adjudication, um, but I, you know, and there's also I I'd be really really happy to see on the table again, and I was happy to hear Harris say it that um, ways to regularize people's status might be on the table. She's being very cautious, right? She's talking about dreamers and dreamers. You know, Trump was trying to go after dreamers. But I think it's really low on the priority list there, and there tends to be consensus that dreamers are relatively sympathetic. Um, so there's not that much risk there. I, the thing that was risky in the speech and in her co apparent commitment is long-term undocumented workers. So that's a real positive step forward. Um, and I would just like to see more of that because do we have an economist in the room? <laughs> Economists. Their models show that when you have regularization, it, it just sends a lot more money into the economy. So that would be a net positive, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, one, more one more question. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Joe Bizzup. I'm a uh, associate professor in the Department of English, also an associate dean in the college. And I want to ask you about something that I- We've been I on a Zoom together. Yes, we <laughs> have actually. <laughs> But actually, it's something I genuinely don't understand. So I can understand how people get swept up in the moral panic about immigration as a large-scale issue. I do not understand why the United States government makes it so difficult for international students to remain in the country after completing their degree. They're childbearing age. Mm -hmm. They are, by any definition, skilled workers. I literally do not understand the rationale. Is it just the disciplinary logic of the government bureaucracy? What is it that prevents us from inviting those degree-completing students to remain in the country? Oh, great question. <laughs> I'm, um, and I have personally have had to spend a lot of energy on this because, you know, many of my graduate students are here on a variety of visas that, um, all of which for anybody in the room who doesn't know this, end in um, deportation, except in the rare circumstance where somebody very quickly is able to acquire a um, green card. But um, all international students are gen gen generally like looking at the clock and waiting for OPT and CPT to wind down. And just so you know, this is not how it is in other countries. Other countries, after they've invested a large amount of money in training people, do not turn around and deport those people. <laughs> yeah. And Australia are both kind of, I think, zooming ahead in terms of international yeah. students. And um, yeah, I mean, and you know, the best part of many universities is the fact that US born folks get to meet and learn from and teach and be in contact with people from a variety of other countries. And like, y you know, the tone of your question implies my response, which is, is the most irrational thing possible. Um, it definitely is, or originates in the idea that, the, that like anxiety about um, US born work and workers, but that, that notion is so outdated that, you know, they, like the, resource waste is just breathtaking. So I'm totally in sympathy with the question. I too find it bananas. And um, there's no sign that we're gonna stop doing this even though it would be like, the m it's such a no-brainer. So thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, thought-provoking lecture. And thank you very much for the facilitation of the question and answer. I sincerely 
thank our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen. Um, and also thank you, uh, Professor Nasli Kibria, for being a moderator. Big thank you to the Jerry Gittner, to Jerry Gittner and his family. We're so fa fortunate to have your support of this endowed lecture. The next lecture in the Arts and Sciences Lecture Series will be on October 9th, the Howard Zinn Memorial Lecture, which this year will be given by Dr. Jel Jelani Cobb, Dean of Columbia J School of Journalism. Dean Cobb's talk, The Half-Life of Freedom, Race and Justice in America Today, will explore, pro explore the past in the current and past in the fight for a better future and racial, racial justice. We hope everyone here will join us for this next lecture. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend.